Uh, my name is Blake Homans. Uh, I'm the symposium editor, uh, one of the symposium editors of Law Review, along with my uh, co-editor, Lauren O'Neill. Um, and I just want to say uh, thank you all for coming. It's been a long day, uh, but I think it's been a lot of fun. Um, I am lucky enough to get to introduce our final keynote speaker uh, for this event. And I'll do that in just a moment, but uh, before I do, uh, while I have you guys, we have to do some thank yous because uh, this was um, an enormous labor of love for the University of Montana Law School, and so there's people that just need to be recognized. First, our sponsors, um, the Montana Legal community showed up big time for this event. Uh, firms around Montana uh, sponsored the Law Review to pay for everything that is taking place today. Uh, I can't name them all, but I do want to make sure that I recognize Morrison, Wilson, Sherwood, and Diola. They gave us an incredibly generous gift uh, that made all this possible. Uh, Dean Gagliardi and her office, uh, including Leslie Collins, um, they were instrumental in getting this pulled off and making this happen. Um, the, uh, the staff uh, of, of the events uh, uh, department of the law school, uh, particularly Lily Soper and Phil Stempen, they've been incredible. Um, law students don't always have the most experienced planning events, but those two do, and, and they made it happen. Uh, Tim Garner in our IT department, you've seen him running around with me trying to, <laughs> trying to make this work, um, and so big thank you to Tim. Um, the entire faculty here at the law school, but particularly uh, Professor Johnstone, uh, we just we owe Professor Johnstone an enormous debt of gratitude. The legal community here in Montana in general owes Professor Johnstone an enormous debt of gratitude, and I think that he very much embodies uh, a spirit of selflessness for future generations that was very present at the Constitutional Convention. And finally, um, you guys. The Montana legal community, um, it's incredible that you guys showed up for a whole day, and those of you who showed up last night, and all of you on Zoom, um, it means a great deal to us, and it's really important. This is a really important time for Montana and for Montana's constitutional history, and so I would just encourage you to stay engaged and to spread the good word about the Montana Constitution because it's an incredible document, and, it, you know... Nothing I can say about it that hasn't been said all day. So I, I hope you guys stay engaged, and I hope you're proud of yourself for for uh, taking it seriously. And so with that, I'll say thank you, and it's my honor uh, to introduce uh, the 21st governor of the state of Montana. Also served as a deputy county attorney for Missoula and was then attorney general of the state, uh, Governor Mark Roscoe. Thank you, thank you. Thank you uh, very kindly, Blake. Uh, I have to explain, I was advised I need to explain at the beginning why it is that I slithered in here through the back door. It seems that uh, my wife and I um, were tested this morning because she had some suspicions about whether or not she may have contracted COVID, and her suspicions were correct. So I was tested as well. And I did not contract COVID. I was allowed to um, come to this gathering tonight if I maintained social distances, if I came with a mask, and if I avoided uh, mingling or loitering. I'm, I'm very much against the, the latter, but very much in favor of the former. But um, I'll have to, under the cloak of darkness, sneak out the back when we're done so that I don't place any of you in harm's way. Secondly, I would like to um, thank genuinely the Law Review, Montana Law Review, and the Law School for inviting me to be a very, very small part of what um, appears to me to be an extraordinary opportunity for us to get together to talk about something incredibly important and uh, hopefully to do something about those things that need something done. And, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't um, recognize the fact that Professor Johnstone has been nominated, as all of you know, a matter of great pride to all of us in the state of Montana. And I'm certain that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will be very beneficially influenced um, by the presence of Professor Johnstone. So, Professor, thank you um, kindly, and uh, thank you for your good service to the people of Montana.
I'd also like to um, say hello to a couple of old friends, Senator Diane Sands and Mr. Speaker, um, Daniel Chemis. I owe him an email. He knows that I owe him an email return, and I thought perhaps I could gain some favor, and you might provide me some excuse if I um, properly recognized um, your extraordinary contributions to Montana. Now, I want to advise you of something that is true, and you should probably know, and there may be some people in the audience who are old enough to know this. But on occasion, older people, when they get nervous, experience a malady that is not altogether comfortable, but their nose can run on occasion. So in the event that I reach for a Kleenex, I want you to be assured that it's not COVID. It's just simply me being nervous. So my instructions were to offer a few thoughts at the beginning and then to make certain that I reserved enough time for us to have some conversation at the end, which um, frankly is always the best moments uh, spent together for me because I learn so much more than I do when I listen to myself speak. I'm going to talk a little bit about history and I hope you'll forgive me for doing that, but I think a recollection by all of us may uh, properly place in perspective some of the discussions and some of the concerns and a great many people across the country and I know in the state of Montana have about our democracy and our constitution. It has not been an easy journey to get where we are. And by that I mean humankind. Throughout all of our human history, people around the world have tried and experimented with just about every conceivable form of government imaginable in various attempts to discover how to live together for the long run in freedom and in peace. As all of us know, it began with the law of the jungle or the state of nature in the beginning where the strongest prospered and the weak did not. Such was followed thereafter over a period of 2,500 years by experience with monarchies, aristocracies, tyrannies, oligarchies, theocracies, colonialism, socialism, communism, and of course, democracy. But after several millennia and the invention of the printing press, the debates about and experiments with various governing structures reached their zenith in the age of enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries. The American colonies, having endured the vagaries of an oppressive and distant monarch for almost two centuries, along with their own impotent and failed governmental structures, set about to draft in Philadelphia in 1787 what was advertised to be amendments to the Articles of Confederation. Context is everything, as we all know. Parenthetically, I think it's important to note the historical context within which the summer meeting in Philadelphia occurred. Truly, the past was prologue to the future yet to be written. The first British uh, colony was established, as you all recall, I'm certain, on the North American continent in 1607. 160 years later, 100 and 60 years later, eight generations, we witnessed growing unrest and tension in the colonies. There were 2,000 British soldiers occupying Boston to enforce the tax laws along with 16,000 colonists. Following the massacre in Boston in 1770, rebellion in the colonies continued. The Boston Tea Party occurred and the first Continental Congress was formed in 1774 in reaction to the British monarch's coercive acts. The Continental Congress would serve as the government of the 13 American colonies until 1789, two years after the convention in Philadelphia. In 1775, the Second Continental Congress convened after the Revolutionary War had begun, just the second Continental Congress. The war would continue for eight years, from 
from 1775 to 1783. And in the middle of that, in 1776, as I'm certain you all know, but I feel duty-bound to advise, the Declaration of Independence was signed. The French entered the war for independence in 1778 in support of the Continental Army. And in 1781, the British were forced to surrender at Yorktown, Virginia. The fighting, however, would not formally end until 1783 when the peace treaty with the British, the Treaty of Paris, was signed. So, since the establishment of that first American colony, seven generations of Americans waited for 176 years for the independence the United States to be recognized around the world. Then the question became, how will the future of this new country be preserved? How will it be governed, if at all? It's important to remember that it had taken five years from 1776 to 1781 to draft the Articles of Confederation, to debate them, to amend them, and to persuade the last state to ratify them. And what did the states agree to by enacting the Articles of Confederation? Article 3 provided the answer. The said states hereby severally enter into a firm league of friendship with each other. Not a solemn bond, not an unbroken or eternal commitment, one to another and to the whole of the Union, but a firm league of friendship. There were no provisions to collect taxes, defend the country, pay the public debt, regulate trade or commerce. The troops during the Revolutionary War lacked boots, food, weapons, ammunition, clothing, and medical care. The Confederation Congress sent requisitions to the state in an effort to pay for the costs of war. Some states paid, but those that did were bitterly angry with those that didn't. A virtual litany of examples revealed just how impotent the Articles of Confederation were. Public debts continued to go unpaid. States found their credit unworthy. Seven states began printing their own money. And some, namely Pennsylvania, made certain that uh, by requiring that money printed in Philadelphia would remain within its borders. During this time, the states found themselves engaged in more and more boundary disputes. They passed tariffs, and they imposed upon one another those tariffs. New Jersey had its own customs service, and nine states had a navy, their own navy. Throughout the years after the Revolutionary War ended, there were continual discussions and proposals offered to amend the Articles of Confederation. Hamilton, then in his early 20s, wrote extensively over a period of seven years, beginning before the war ended, about the necessity for a constitutional convention. The calls universally of the people that advocated the Articles went unheeded and were largely ignored. But as it happened, in 1785, Maryland and Virginia became entangled in a very serious dispute over navigation on the Potomac River. Both states sent commissioners to Mount Vernon to discuss the disagreement. Seeing the chance to enlist the cooperation of neighboring states, the commission was enlarged and set to meet in Annapolis in September 1786. Prior to the Annapolis meeting, however, on August 29th, 1786, desperate farmers in western Massachusetts, having concluded that they were being ruinously taxed by Boston and suffering the seizure of their property by officials, rose in revolt. Armed with pitchforks and posts, the participants in Shays' Rebellion marched on county courthouses, threatening and wreaking havoc. Fourteen rioting leaders were condemned to death for their insurrection, although ultimately were pardoned. But, as laborious as recalling this history might be, it was with this knowledge of all of these happenings and more that the Annapolis Commission met in September 1786. Out of that meeting came a recommendation 
that all 13 states appoint delegates to meet in May 1787 to consider the regulation of trade and commerce in the United States. The Continental Congress, proceeding cautiously and some would allege suspiciously, resolved that the convention was to be confined, and I quote, to the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. Seventy-four delegates were named to what was referred to in the beginning as the convention in Philadelphia. In the end, 55 took part in the process. On Monday, May 14, 1787, only Virginia and Pennsylvania were represented. It was the 25th of May, before, 11 days later, before a quorum of seven states was obtained and the convention officially opened. It was not altogether an inspiring beginning. It is fair to say that all of the delegates came to the convention with a determination to restructure the Articles of Confederation. But what happened at the convention was something quite different and extraordinary. By the end of 116 days and 89 days of meeting, its delegates had agreed to go far beyond amending the Articles of Confederation and instead had crafted a constitution for the United States of America, which was ratified by the required majority of nine states barely 10 months later. Now, why do I focus so much on the Constitutional Convention in 1787? Because it, there are many parallels between what occurred in that convention and what occurred in Montana in 1972. <clears throat> the, the fact of the matter is that the Constitution in Montana, its creation in 1789, revealed that actually it was the third attempt at a Constitution, at least, perhaps there were more, for the people of Montana to fashion a foundational document specifying the duties and obligations in a social contract between the people and their government. In 1889, a slight difference, Congress passed an enabling act that finally permitted Montana to be admitted to the Union after adopting and ratifying a constitution. So the third constitution in Montana was written incident to its admission to the Union. And Montana became the 41st state, as all of you know, on November 8, 1889. The people of Montana lived with the 1889 Constitution for 83 years. It was designed from the beginning to be weak in its provision of a capacity to govern in the executive branch of government, establishing almost deliberately ineffective state government, much to the advantage of the powerful, largely the mining interests, who coincidentally exempted themselves and their properties from taxation. There were similar struggles throughout the process of discussing the initial, of course, consideration of the 1889 Constitution and ultimately how to go about allowing for its amendment. Amending the 1889 Constitution was an extraordinarily difficult and challenging task. So, under the auspices of, uh, inf and influence of the League of Women Voters, and the American Association of University Women, there was a significant effort made to present to the people of Montana an opportunity to restruct their constitutional arrangement. It was approved when it was offered after the legislature approved it by the people of Montana with a 65% plurality. Upon convening, a number of things happened that bear a very fair consideration to what happened during the Constitutional Convention of 1787. When you look back at that convention again, to begin with, there were no political parties in 1787. They were not identified nor operative. The delegates were all present in the same room for 89 days of discussion and argument at Independence Hall. There were procedural rules of conduct agreed upon and observed. There were curtains over the windows and the imposition of a rule of confidentiality in order to prevent rumors, misinformation, and disinformation from circulating in the colonies. Most importantly, 
There was no internet or social media. And I, and I, I know that um, might appear to be somewhat humorous in some respect, but I think it has a profound impact on how it was that ultimately they conducted their deliberation. There was no internet or social media, so it was simply impossible to utilize hacking techniques to flood the zone, as they say, with deafening noise and with prevarication. Each state had one vote, and a majority of a state's delegates had to be present and agree that the state's uh, vote would be counted by their presence. Each delegate could speak only once on each issue until all of the delegates received the opportunity to speak, and then only with special permission of the convention delegates. The rules explicitly required the delegates to pay close attention to the presentations by other delegates, and it forbid, forbid the reading of books, documents, or papers while one of the delegates was speaking. Finally, all of the comments were required to be addressed to the president in order to avoid as much as possible elevated rhetoric between delegates involved in the same exchange. Hasten all those years later, between 1889 and 1972 and 1787 as well, and you find a constitutional convention called in the state of Montana. And what happened there? The delegates all reported, none of them elected officials. They all decided early on that they would be seated alphabetically instead of by party. There were 58 Democrats elected and 36 Republicans along with five independents. The decision was made again that they would share authority, committee chairmanships, and proceed as if they were being treated all equally regardless of which party may have been in the majority. Over the course of time, and Rick Applegate, my childhood friend from Libby, Montana, I'm certain has, on more than one occasion, and others who have been here before you, who know this history so intimately well, would um, affirm on every occasion that these decisions had a critical importance, along with the gender balance that had been attempted with 19 women present in the delegation after only one had served in the prior legislative session. The gender balance uh, brought more than just gender balance. It brought wisdom and insight and I believe a sense of uh, conduct that allowed for them, all of them, to make um, great progress as a result of their presence. They met together for 54 days in the same room, and ultimately all of them signed the Constitution. Now, why, why would I take so much time to share all that history with all of you, which you may have already been aware of? And here is my simple reply. This year we celebrate the 50th anniversary, as you know, of our own Constitution. On July 4th, we celebrated the 246th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And on June 21st, um, after celebrating the anniversary of our own Constitution, in, we celebrated the United States Constitution, or will, in the fall that was ratified 234 years ago. In my discussions with my fellow citizens across the state of Montana and across the country, I think it is absolutely clear that there is great concern about the health and safety of our Constitution, our democracy, and our way of life. This year, there was a poll done, just not all that long ago, by the University of Maryland and the Washington Post. And in that poll, it revealed that the percentage of Americans who believe that violent action against their government is justified stood at 34 percent, higher than in past polls dating back more than two decades. That was followed by another poll conducted by National Public Radio in January of 2022. The results of that poll revealed that 70 percent of Americans believe that America is in crisis and at risk of failing. You'll recall, I'm sure Benjamin Franklin predicted and warned of such moments 
upon the adjournment of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. As he exited and a question was presented to him, do we have a monarchy or a republic? His response was prophetic. You have a republic if you can keep it. And that remains, as it did in the beginning, the existential question of our time. Can we keep our republic? And can we keep it if the values and virtues of the rule of law, purposely and knowingly infused into our Constitution, are not faithfully and consensually observed? It appears undeniable that there are ominous and unmistakable warning signs all around us that our constitutional government and our republic are confronting moments of uncertainty and peril. A people who cannot talk to or listen to each other, who do not remember the pledge they made to one another, who do not respect each other, who will not sincerely and fairly consider the thoughts of each other, who do not trust each other, and who cannot reason with each other, have abandoned the virtue upon which the life of our democracy depends and cannot live in freedom without. The most probable way for our republic to vanish is through a lack of honor and fidelity to the Constitution and the rule of law and the promises that we make to one another. Not surprisingly, a pledge of honor and fidelity is precisely the promise we make to each other as Americans, and it's also the precise and indispensable pledge required by our constitutional oath of office. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution, and that I will discharge the duties of my office with fidelity, so help me God. What did the framers of our Constitution and the Montana Constitution 185 years later intend when they chose fidelity to be the virtue that provides guidance for appropriate behavior by every citizen and every office holder who holds an office or public trust. And what is this fidelity, which we hear recited at every swearing-in ceremony, but in all probability have rarely stopped to thoughtfully and thoroughly consider? It is, in a word, faithfulness. Faithfulness to the preservation of our union. Faithfulness to our fellow citizens. Faithfulness to the cause of freedom. Faithfulness to a shared set of values. That faithfulness is demonstrated by unequivocal loyalty, transcendent loyalty and support of the rule of law, all of which we swear to abide by, above all else, without exception, without avoidance, without deceit, without connivance, and without obfuscation. And the fidelity referred to in our oath presumes not just faithfulness to the actual words of our constitutions, but faithfulness to the spirit that permeates those constitutions as well. A spirit recognized and requited by humility, respect of others and the rights of others, Dignity, decency, integrity, honor, self-discipline, self-examination, and just common courtesy. This fidelity of which we speak is synonymous with the rule of law and is the exact opposite of seeking power for its own sake, which history has revealed time and again to be a fool's errand. As Winston Churchill once remarked, Dictators ride to and fro upon tigers, which they dare not dismount, for the tigers are getting hungry. Most of us in this room grew up in an America as it used to be, one of the world's most stubbornly civil societies and cultures, where being a neighbor meant more than merely living next door to another family. Throughout our growing up years, and into adulthood and a new millennium, we shared a positive attitude about life, about neighbors, about families, about values. We suspected the best of each other until proven wrong, a sort of presumption of innocence 
and good faith that was accorded from the beginning and instinctively one to another. Contrast that with the awkward, thoughtless, poisonous, mean, frequently inaccurate, and false public communications of today, where 360,000 tweets a minute are instantaneously dispatched and received every minute of every hour of every day. That's how much of the country and much of the world talks to each other these days. It's a dizzying, dizzying vacuous, and perilous way of behavior. Chances for people with diverse views sitting across a table from one another and talking to each other about how to solve difficult and important problems have been substantially diminished and now most of the time eliminated in favor of the new mindless electronic rituals that produce infinitely more confusion and anger than understanding. It seems almost impossible to manage the noise, to control the flood of unverified and frequently inaccurate communications, oftentimes conceived in rage and competition and then once dispatched, regretted, because all of that hateful piffle is now a matter of public record. How is it that we stop this runaway train as it picks up speed and leaves so much disaster and destruction along the way? Don't get me wrong, the internet is a marvelous creation in so many ways, but it has also strained and stunted our social existence, especially our political affairs, with irresponsible and baseless suggestions of the existence of circumstances and situations that have absolutely no basis in fact. Social media has left us in an almost constant state of shared incomprehension and confusion. We have to return to the deliberative processes and the rule of law embedded in our constitutions. If we don't, more and more policy decisions will be made on the basis of destructive rumor rather than on facts and context. The result is the production of exponentially growing fiction, exhaustion, and bitterness. And in the end, the unraveling of our democracy and our way of life. It truly is that urgent. We have to bring more self-discipline, more integrity and sensitivity to our communications and comments, individually and collectively, to fulfill the requirements of fidelity to one another, fidelity to the cause of freedom, fidelity to the defense of our democracy, and fidelity to the shared belief we have in the future of our country and our state. It's really not a big ask. I'm not suggesting hopelessly, as some aging senior citizen, a return to simpler times. I'm calling, hopefully, for a return to the rule of law, to simple, timeless, and enduring values, presuming the best of each other, listening in good faith before acting and responding, exuding generosity and grace, self-correcting, our own mistakes, denying our own self-interest in the best interest of those we live with, seeking out those good angels of our nature instead of the demons of those that we oppose, and being ambitious to accomplish something, not to be somebody. I'm suggesting that much more can be accomplished practically and politically by shunning the tired and the perverted rhetorical games of modern political discourse, now magnified exponentially and given eternal life by the Internet. I'm suggesting that we focus on carefully listening to each other, seeing and sometimes hearing with our hearts, gathering the facts before we make up our minds and then actually fixing our society's problems instead of being distracted by flashing lights and engaging in the to and fro of never-ending, instantaneous, bitter, and all too often coarse and careless electronic communications that can be dispatched at the speed of light with a silent click to every corner of the planet Earth and beyond at least 2.4 billion times a second. Democracy is a voluntary association 
of individuals. To paraphrase a famous movie producer, if people don't want to come, you can't stop them. It's a dynamic institution. It's always changing. It can, it can dynamically deteriorate and rot just as quickly as it can dynamically improve. Sadly, I think we have much taken it for granted over the last few years. We hear so much about our divisions. We are conditioned by the modern media to think that we have little in common as a nation and as a people. But I believe the majority of the American people, and I have been traveling quite a bit across the country, and I firmly believe the great middle of America are tired of the intramural wars, where all sides emphasize only their divisions with the hopes of having them magnified and instantaneously scattered across the landscape, courtesy of the internet and the propaganda that's incessantly pervaded by political hucksters on television and other means of communication. As one precocious Montanan told me at her eighth grade graduation, I believe it was in Biddle, Montana, she was the only graduate. We are not different groups of Americans, or different, different groups of people in America, she said. We are, she said, one group of different Americans. One group of different Americans. I've never forgotten that. They would serve us all to remember it. We've got problems in this country and in our individual states. And as we celebrate, which we rightly should do, an extraordinary moment in our history, the creation of this wonderfully miraculous and poetic constitution that has served us so well, we must seek its protection and its defense on every occasion. And we have to rediscover the rule of law that metaphysically binds us together in freedom. It's only out of our union that we have freedom and independence and stability. So let us quickly and completely abandon a solitary and destructive search for power and control and get on about fixing our problems and taking care of one another with fidelity. So help us God. So thank you very much for letting me share my thoughts about those particular issues. And if you have some cross-examination, I'd be happy to, to uh, reply to your questions. Repeat myself all the time. And I would suggest to you that what other choices do we have? As, as a human race, we, we've tried virtually everything. We went through all those things I mentioned before with despots and tyrants. And we settled upon democracy with all of its virtuous values. You know, that's what Monty Eskew described as uh, the central moving force of a democracy when he was writing about it in the 17th or the 18th century, and Jefferson was in France, of course, during the time the convention was being considered, and Montesquieu was referenced or sought as a guide more often than any other source of information other than the Bible, interestingly. And so when you think about all of the things we've tried, what's the alternative? And if we're going to change how we go about things, the tone and tenor, and the deliberative processes of our country, then who is to do it if not them? Um, you, you know, when you, when you think about um, uh, running for office, I know it can be a bit daunting, um, but 
the journey is worth it. And without them, uh, it's, it's not going to be that we end up with a country that's capable of survival. The adhesive is peeling away now. You know, the one thing, the one branch of government that I believe is the last remaining vestige of a mirror image of what was expected when it was described in the separation of powers and the judicial articles in our two constitutions, is the judiciary still operating under the rule of law and hopefully will continue. And with the right election results, some um, I'm fairly certain that it will. Um, but if we don't sound the clarion call, I wondered the same thing to myself when in 2016, I didn't find great pleasure or confidence in the candidate that was offered from my party. And at that moment in time, I simply let it be known, and not quietly, with the op-ed in a national newspaper. And I think that um, it was too late. You know, it was too late to change the flow of what was uh, unfolding. And um, as a consequence of that, there was a certain... Um, beach um, front that was gathered in and preserved for all the things that happened thereafter in um, from 2016 to 2020. Um, I learned through that process that I had to be earlier and I had to anticipate and I had to act and I don't know if I can bend the course of history. That's not important. I'm convinced that the sum total of the events of all of us will. So I would suggest to them, first of all, that what alternative is there do they want to live in freedom and independence or not? And if they do, how is it that they're going to preserve the opportunity for that to continue? And that is by getting engaged and, and running for office and representing the people that they live with. So um, it actually is a glorious enterprise. And when it operates with all of its noble attributes without being mutated and undermined by those who seek control only, for what point I've never understood, um, instead of accomplishment of objective, I think they would find it quite exhilarating. Daniel Chemis and I and Diane Sands and I found ourselves frequently on different sides of issues, but I trusted them completely because I knew they were acting in accordance with their conscience and that they were always trying to do the right thing for the right reasons. At the end of the day, I can disagree about policy, but I can't disagree about character. And to this very day, we remain friends, and I think uh, good colleagues who have trust and confidence, even though we may see policy issues in a different light. So I would encourage them with um, pleading and um, with a conviction that it is a life worth living and that your participation is absolutely essential. Thank you.